about a more general formulation of quantum mechanics. So far what we have done is to introduce the ideas of quantum mechanics using some dynamical variables. We took one dynamical variable to be the position of a particle in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. We found what the action should be. Then I also described to you how electrodynamics can be described in the same way by taking the Fourier component of the vector potential as the dynamical variable. That we will take up for much more detailed discussion towards the end of the course. The idea here is that there is no unique trajectory or history which a quantum mechanical system takes when it goes from some values of dynamical variable at time t is equal to t1 to another set of values. Okay, this is what you should take as the key message. So if you are talking about a particle, then the particle's position at uh, time t1 if it is x1, then the particle's position at time t2 is x2. Classically, I would have said that there is a definite trajectory connecting these two. What does that mean? What it means is that if I have a particle which is going from one point to another, this is classical physics, this is T and a particle which is going from here to here, then at any intermediate time, I know where it was. So once I know this trajectory, then I know where it was at any intermediate time. Okay? But if it is going to take all possible paths between these two, then at an intermediate time, the position of the particle is not well defined. It, is, it only has a probabilistic interpretation. It does not have a unique position. So we want to take this a little bit more further. If the position of the particle is not well defined in between, then neither is its momentum. And that is anyway understandable because if the position and the momentum are simultaneously known, then we know the trajectory. So since the trajectory is ill defined, then we know that even if we measure the position, we will not be able to measure the momentum and vice versa. The question is how does this come about? And if this is indeed the case, how are we going to do physics? I mean, how are we going to think in terms of momentum or other operators, etc. So I want to introduce to you or motivate to you how this can be done in terms of operators. Normally in quantum mechanics textbook, it will just be introduced as a postulate. But I will try to motivate it in a logical way starting from this so that it won't come as a surprise. Okay? So the first thing which we know is that as far as position is concerned, now we will work with, uh, well we can actually work with one dimension but let me work with three dimensions. So if I have the wave function, then mode psi square, I will call it rho of t comma x alpha. Remember that x alpha stands for the Cartesian components of the vector x1, x2, x3 or x, y, z. So mode psi square will be some function, some real function. And this quantity we have been interpreting as the probability and probability for the particle to be found at this x alpha at time t. Okay, with a small d3x added so that the measure is all proper and things like that. So if I have this, then I can calculate the mean value of any function of x. Right? We know what is the position. So if you if you have x square, then you can calculate using this probability distribution, I can calculate x square, x cubed, anything. In particular, I can compute a mean path which I will denote by x bar alpha, which is just integral over the whole volume, which is d3x, x alpha times rho. Now rho depends on t and x alpha. I have integrated over x alpha, so this is going to depend on t. So this is a unique function of t given the state. Given the state, you know this, and then you can compute this. So this is like an average trajectory. All right, so we have got this. Now, once you have got an average trajectory, you can also define, for example, the average momentum. So we will define it to be in non-relativistic mechanics, m times x bar alpha dot. This is like the average velocity, mass times that average velocity give you the average moment. So I have got that to be equal to 
integral over dv x alpha x alpha here is just a variable times rho dot. I want to know what this quantity is. So, in order to do that I need an equation for rho dot which is what I am going to derive for you next. So, to do that let us start with the Schrodinger equation. I will write the Schrodinger equation in this form I psi dot equals minus 1 over 2 m d alpha d alpha of psi. Let me first write it down and then explain what it is plus v psi. Okay, there are various things which I had done here which you should learn as early as possible that is why I am bringing it in. So, the first thing is that I have put h cross equals 1. Okay. So, as much as possible hereafter I will work with h cross equals 1 because we do not need to take uh, classical limit and things like that. And it is good for you to get accustomed to notations in which h cross c etc are set to 1. This is what you will learn in theoretical physics most of the time. You should know how to reintroduce it from dimensional considerations when required. So, just to train you in that I have put h cross equals 1 there is h cross square here which is also 1. Second, I have introduced a notation d alpha d alpha. This is del square, right? Del square is d square x by dx square plus d square y by ds square etc. So, there is a d by dx multiplied by a d by dx, then d by dy multiplied by d by dy. That is what I have implied here by saying that I am this alpha runs 1, 2, 3. When alpha is 1, it is d square by dx square. When alpha is 2, it is d square by dy square, etc. So, when an index appears twice in a given notation, in a given expression, it is assumed that it is summed over. So, this is a great contribution from Einstein. This is probably the second great contribution from Einstein. First is gr, third is special relativity. So, it is surprising that this very powerful notation was missed out by people like uh, Jacobi or Rainman or everyone who did tensor analysis, Newton, nobody has Maxwell, nobody has thought of it and uh, this simplifies things tremendously. So, I want you to learn how to use that thing and again this is one of those things where if you do not think about it, it will work. Okay, it will automatically take care of itself, that is the power of that notation. Sir, yeah. is this superscript over I am com coming to it. Now, I have also put a superscript and a subscript. We are only going to do uh, Cartesian components in this particular analysis. So, it does not matter where I put it. Later on somebody when you when you learn GR and things like that there will be a distinction between superscript and subscript. This will happen if you use polar coordinates and all that. For our purpose it does not matter. It is just a notational convenience. Okay? That is all I am going to do. Okay. Now, I have got this equation. So, what I want is an equation for rho dot. Rho dot will have psi star psi dot and then a psi psi star dot. So, I also need a corresponding equation for the psi star, right. So, the simplest way to do this is to take that equation and multiply by psi star. So, I get i psi star psi dot equals minus 1 over 2 m d psi star d alpha d alpha psi plus v mod psi square. So, I multiplied by psi star. Now, I am going to write down its complex conjugate equation. That will be minus i psi psi star dot equals minus 1 over 2 m psi d alpha d alpha psi star. Just keep an eye on I making any algebraic errors because then later on we will have to keep going around trying to figure out where it has gone wrong. So, I have this equation. Then I am going to subtract one from the other. So, when I subtract this, this minus sign will become plus sign. So, I get i times uh, d rho by dt. So, that is fine. Okay. 
So I get on the left hand side I rho dot. On the right hand side this goes away. So I get a minus 1 over 2m that is common. I am subtracting this from this. So I get psi star d alpha d alpha psi minus psi d alpha d alpha of psi star. So this I want to write in a slightly different way. I want to write this as d alpha of psi star d alpha psi minus d alpha of psi star mod square. What have I done? I have pulled this d alpha through this. So it is d alpha the look at this. This is d alpha of this quantity if I take. I get a psi star d alpha d alpha psi which is what I want. Then I get an unwanted term which is d alpha of psi star d alpha of psi which is more d alpha psi ok I could have written it as psi psi or psi star mode square and that quantity I have subtracted out ok. Now I can write this also in the exactly the same way. This term will now cancel out. So what I will be left with is just this term and here I will have correspondingly d alpha of psi d alpha of psi star. Then there is a minus 1 over 2 m and then there is a d alpha common so I am going to take that out and you end up with this. Okay. So let us multiply both sides by i. So there is a minus sign, this minus sign goes away and you pick up an i. So this is the equation which I get and this entire expression I will write as some d alpha of j alpha. So j alpha for me stands for whatever is left which is i over 2m psi star d alpha psi minus psi d alpha psi star. Okay. So many textbooks will define this j alpha with an opposite sign that is they want to write the rho dot plus uh, divergence of j is equal to 0 but it does not matter we are just going to use it for a moment and then forget about it. So I have an equation for rho dot what you should go with is this quantity okay that I want to plug in here. So if I do that then I get the mean value of the momentum which is defined to be m times x bar alpha dotted which is integral over volume of x alpha rho dot, rho dot is some d alpha of j alpha but this is the only place where with notations you have to be careful. This alpha is summed over. So d alpha of j alpha is same as d beta of j beta. But if I wrote here d alpha j alpha then I will have 3 alphas there you should never get that ok. So you write it like this. Now you can do a little bit more window dressing on this. First you write this term as this entire uh, expression inside as integral over dv. You will have one term which is d beta of x alpha j beta integrated over the whole volume. Then you will have another term which is minus d beta acting on x alpha. What is d beta of x alpha? That is Kronecker delta alpha beta because if alpha is equal to beta it is 1 otherwise it is 0. So Kronecker delta alpha beta with this beta contracted will give you j alpha. Then there was another term which I threw away there is a d beta of this whole thing integrated over a volume. 
How can I throw it away? Because this is like a divergence of some quantity integrated over the whole volume. That by Gauss theorem is the quantity on the boundary. If I am integrating over all space, the contribution is coming from infinity. And we are going to assume that all these quantities, psi, psi square, derivatives of psi, everything vanishes at infinity, at very far away from the thing. So that term is 0. So you end up getting an expression like this for P alpha, average value of the moment. Now what is this uh, J alpha here? J alpha here is this quantity. So this I want to again clean up a little bit. So first if I look at this term, I would prefer all the derivatives acting on psi. So this term is going to give me minus this particular term d alpha of mod psi square. I am taking d alpha outside of this whole expression. Then plus psi star d alpha of psi. Yeah. That d will beta j beta. Yes. Is a divergence. d beta that is divergence. No, what happens is the following. This I am writing as d beta of x alpha j beta minus j beta d beta of x alpha. You are with me up to this point. Now, this quantity is Kronecker delta. So, this is delta of alpha beta, right? So I am summing over this and that gives you J alpha, right? This term vanishes because this when I am integrating over all volume, take any one component, take the component where beta is x. It is d by dx and in the integral there is a dx. So when you are integrating, you get contributions at x is equal to plus and minus infinity and that way all the terms vanish there, okay? So this is what you end up with. So here this J alpha I had just done one more cleaning up. So I get a, I write this in terms of this derivative. So I have this quantity which is exactly the same as this. Then I have a D alpha of psi square. But again that is a gradient D alpha of psi square if I integrate over dV that it has d by dx, d by dy, d by dz. When I am integrating, I am integrating over dx, dy, dz, all the components vanish. So if you do all this and take care of the signs correctly, what you will find is that the final result is given by an expression which you will recognize. It might not have been derived to you in this form, but this is what you will get. So this is what you should carry home again. Starting from the average value of the position given by this expression, and taking a time derivative, we found that the average volume of uh, value of the momentum is given by psi star minus i d by d alpha of psi. If you had kept h crosses everywhere, you would have picked up another h cross here, okay? Minus i h cross gradient is what you are getting. Of course, if you want to be fancy, which is actually useful, you can write this as psi star x alpha psi. Because this rho is mod psi square, it's just multiplication. So you put on psi star on the left, on psi star on the right. So you find an interesting pattern emerging. It is not completely clear yet, but you find that the mean value of x is given by some x alpha sitting between psi and psi star. You can think of this x alpha as an operator which just multiplies. Then here you find that uh, mean value of momentum is given by some other operator sitting there. Okay, so far so good. But this is not really nice. If you want the mean value of x alpha, I had a probability density in the x space. This was the probability to find a particular value x alpha. Then I calculated the average using that probability density. It would have been much nicer if I have got a mean value of momentum as a probability density for momentum multiplied by momentum, I have integrated over the momentum space. Right? Can you do that? Can we write this in that form? It turns out that that is very easy. What you want to do is just introduce 
you write this psi which is uh, t and x in Fourier space. So, you write it as uh, d 3 p over 2 pi the whole cubed some phi which depends on p and t e to the i p dot x. Okay? Yeah. In which term? Here. When I am calculating the, ah, no, 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 this is just a parameter here. Wait, no, this is not a function of t, that is the whole point. Because let us, let us go back, there is a fundamental error here. Take this Schrodinger equation. Everything is coming from the Schrodinger equation. In the Schrodinger equation, these are partial derivatives with respect to x and these are partial derivatives with respect to time. Time and x are independent variable. You never ever differentiate x with respect to t in Schrodinger picture. You see, psi is a function of t and x. So, this x is what is carried forward here. That is not a function of time. Okay? So, this is just a parameter running here. As See, when you are having x, y, z, these are uh, independent variable. When you differentiate with respect to y, I do not think of x as a function of y. Just like that, when I differentiate with respect to time, I do not think of x as a function of t. Okay? This comes from this partial differential equation. Much later on, we will think in terms of operators which depend on time. Right now, there are no operators here. It is just, I am still doing everything by normal, uh, you know, probability and averages and things like that. I want to motivate you where operators come from. That I have not done here. Okay. Fine. So, suppose you introduce this Fourier transform. Then it is very easy because this minus i d by d alpha acting on e to the i p, uh, p uh, this quantity, it is minus gradient. So, it will bring down an i p. There is an i into i and a minus sign. So, these are just eigenfunctions of this operator. So, that means you will just pick up p times phi. Then you multiply by phi star and you integrate over all of them. So, this can be written, the same expression can be written. It is completely straightforward computation, but you should do it once if you have not done it before. You will find that this expression can be written as integral over d 3 p over 2 pi the whole cube p alpha phi of p alpha t the whole square. This is the part I am leaving it to you to derive. I mean, it is it's completely straightforward. It is almost uh, you look see proof. You plug this in, you will just get p and phi. Then when you put psi star, you will get a phi star and a minus p x minus p y. And then when you integrate over the volume, that will give you a direct delta function and you will just get this quantity. Now, this is nice. It is almost there. The first thing, okay. So, let us do it step by step. First of all, if I now think of this quantity, as some probability density in momentum space, then I do get this as the average value of p. Okay? So, I have an interpretation. I have an interpretation that the psi represents or mod psi square represents the probability density in real space. If I take its Fourier transform, it represents the probability density in the momentum space. Not completely because of this 2 pi the whole cube factor. So, in order to avoid that, what people normally do is to redefine this phi by taking a 2 pi to the pi 3 by 2 inside. Okay? So, you will define your Fourier transform not like this, but with the 3 by 2. Okay? This is this is just again as I said is just a fancy way of uh, if you want a symmetry in this you might as well work with this but let us let us do it this way it is it is nicer okay so you have a definition here which is almost same as this okay so what have we got what we have found is that if you want to have the mean value of x alpha I can take psi and do this computation. If I want mean value of momentum, I can take its Fourier transform and do this computation. 
Now, I can also get mean value of momentum by using this approach. I can take psi and do this. Can I do reverse? Can I get the mean value of x if I am only given phi? Okay. Obviously, you can because phi and psi are just related by a Fourier transform. If you do that, you will find that the mean value of x is also given by integral over volume in momentum space phi star i d alpha where it is ok let me be very explicit let me put an alpha here just for fun d by d p alpha of phi where phi is a momentum space expression. So, what you find these four formulas are the crucial ones. So, I have this, this underline, that underline and I will underline this also. So, you find that there are two ways of computing the mean value of x alpha and there are two ways of computing the mean value of momentum which are given here and here. So, now there is a general structure which emerges. Suppose you want to compute the mean value of some variable, uh, let me call that variable m and you are computing the mean value. Then what it is telling you is that you have some kind of an integration of a wave function which I will I will call it, uh, let me put it capital psi very formally and then there is an operator m and then I will put this psi again. So, this is purely formal notation. So, let me explain to you what it means. First, if this dv is real space that is dv is equal to dv of x dx dy dz, then if you want to calculate the mean value of x, you put here x and you put here the standard psi that is our first equation. If you want momentum expectation value, I can take this m to be minus i d alpha, take these to be again psi and integrate over x and you can get that. Alternatively, I can think of this psi as the wave function in momentum space which is our phi. Then if you want the position, then I have to use this. If I want momentum, I can use this. So, this is the structure which emerges. Okay, so, let us let us take a step back and see what we have. Yeah. Uh, should there be a psi star? M yeah, sure. Sorry. Should be psi star. So, everywhere it is it is with a complex conjugate which we are using. So, this is the structure which we have and what it tells you is that I can think of, I can associate with whatever mean value which I am computing an operator. Okay. Now, what is this operator? Suppose I am looking at uh, x alpha as the quantity which I want, the position. Then it has two operators we have already found. One is just x alpha multiplication. The other is i d by d p alpha. This is the operator which we used when we are working in momentum space. Similarly, if I want p, p beta, it is minus i d by d x beta in one case and it is just multiplication by p beta in the other case, right. So, what we are finding is that these observables which we have can be represented by different kinds of operators depending on whether I am going to choose a representation based on x or a representation based on p. So, one is called the coordinate representation, the other is called the momentum representation. So, if I use coordinate representation, then x is denoted by a multiplication and uh, the corresponding quantity, if you want to have p, it is denoted by this. While if I am using the momentum representation, then this is going, x is going to be a derivative operator, momentum will be p beta. With this, we can obtain all the results which we have done. 
But why did it work? There is one crucial place where we made this work when we are going from here to here. That is, we, we up, to, up to this point is just Schrodinger equation. We just took Schrodinger equation, computed it, and we found that. What told us that you can do this like this? Of course, mathematically it is correct. But what led you to work with this? Now, if you think a little bit, these quantities are the eigenfunctions of this object. Okay? So, we can play this game in general. What we are going to do is that suppose I have some operator m and let us say that this has a set of eigenfunctions. That is this operator acting on a set of functions fn gives you let us say lambda n fn. I will assume that these Fn's are orthonormal. That is, I first introduce a dot product in the space of complex functions. Let me let me just be formal for a moment. So, if I have a function, let us say, okay, again I will use F and G. Uh, let us see G F. This symbol stands for a dot product. This is defined to be if I am using X representation dvx g star f. Okay, this is purely a definition, but this comes from linear algebra theory, but we do not need to do too much of that theoretical structure. For us, we can think of it as purely as a definition. So, by this definition, I will assume that these fn's are orthonormal in the sense that if I take fn, fm, the dot product, that is going to be delta n. Okay. So, because it has this orthonormality and it is also taken to be a complete set of uh, functions. So, we will work with observables where this operator has these properties. Then what we can do is that all these computations which we are doing, suppose I have a, a state which is represented in co coordinate representation by some wave function psi. Then what I can do is that I can take that psi and I can expand it in this basis. I am interested in a particular operator m. So, I go to its eigenfunction representation. Then I am going to expand this as C n f n. In general, of course, I had to worry about time dependence as well, but let us stick to a given time. So, we are only going to do everything in, in special coordinate. I am fixing the time, uh, I am freezing the time everywhere. So, I have expanded like this. Now, suppose I act on this with m. Then I act on this with m. So, m times fn is going to give me a lambda n fn. Then I put a psi star m psi. So, that is going to be summation over n. Then I need another summation over m. There is a lambda n c n f n. This much is coming from m acting on psi. Then I have a psi star. For psi star, I will have to take the star of this and put. So, that is C n star, sorry, C m star, F m star. Then I am going to integrate this over the whole volume. Because I am just trying to get this structure. Okay? So, I am going to integrate this over whole volume. So, I am going to integrate this things which depend on x are f n and f m star. I am integrating that over whole volume. That is where this dot product kicks in. That becomes a Kronecker delta. So, I get the Kronecker delta on integrating over this. So, I have a delta n m. That merely says replace all the m's by n and then uh, take away the summation over n. Now, C n and C n star I can write as mode square. So, I get lambda n mode C n square. So, now I think I can remove this m acting on this. Let me keep it like this. 
So this is what we have proved. So let us go through this once again. If I have some observable which I am interested in and I associate an operator m with it such that it has eigenfunctions, it forms a complete basis and the eigenfunctions can be, nor, uh, be treated, taken to be orthonormal with respect to this dot product. Then if I compute this quantity, the mean value of that operator in any given state, then I find that that is given by this result. This is very nice. This is very general now. We are not talking about momentum or position or any of them. We are taking a hint from this because that is why I wanted to introduce this in this way. I do not want to just abstractly say that there is Hilbert space and there are operators, etc. But when you look at this, you find that in momentum, this is what is happening. So we are just abstracting away that idea. This idea worked because we use these eigenfunctions. So we are going to generalize it by choosing some eigenfunctions and work this through. So what does this tell you? This tells you that suppose the we are computing the some kind of an average value here because that was the whole idea that average value of this quantity is given by an operator inserted in between for m bar, right? So the average value seems to be almost like a probability distribution. If you think of cn square as a probability and lambda n as different observed values, then this is just a probability distribution. So it is consistent in this framework to assume that if I have a wave function psi and I expand it in terms of the eigenfunctions of some operator, then every measurement of that particular quantity can give you, it is not deterministic, so it can give you different values and it can give you values which are the eigenvalues of that operator with the probability c n square. This is how quantum mechanics is interpreted. So to every observable, you are going to introduce an operator. Then you are going to say that when you make a measurement of that observable, the value you are going to get is an eigenvalue of that operator. And the probability that you will get that particular eigenvalue is given by the coefficient of the expansion of the wave function in terms of those quantities. Now, I do not want to give an impression that I had derived this. In fact, nobody has derived this and this is a deep unsolved mystery of quantum mechanics why this works. I will tell you in a moment exactly where the mystery comes from. Mystery comes not from these definitions but when we go one step later. But I have motivated it. I have shown you that how it works for x and p which are very nicely defined quantities and then we have seen where it comes from. Abstracting it out, we are introducing this structure. Now, there are some obvious constraints on this. In general, if you take an operator, there is no guarantee that lambda n's are real. So every observable we want to say is associated with an operator for which the eigenvalues are real. These are called Hermitian operators. So you will assume these are real. And then this summation over n in general can be an integration. In fact, we already saw integration here. So here the p alpha is a continuous variable. So the summation over a different p is like integration. So those things we will assume that as things go on, whether you want to integrate or whether you are going to sum over discrete values, etc., we will just take it as it comes. Okay. So except for these two, you seem to have a nice formalism here. The problem arises when you actually ask the following question. Suppose you have a particle which is going from one place to another. And let us say that the particle in coordinate representation is actually represented by a wave function which is the solution to our Schrodinger equation. So it is in some state psi. Okay? And I expand that state in terms of the eigenfunctions of some operator. I do not even care what that operator is but I have just expanded it. Now suppose you produce thousands of such systems. That is, you take uh, whatever is the experimental configuration which had this particle, you make thousands of copies of this, a large number n of these copies and uh, all of them are evolving by this wave function. And in all these systems, 
you make a measurement of this quantity m. Okay. Then what you will find is that when you make the measurement just as any intermediate it is following all the trajectories when you make the measurement you will get different values and each observations will give you a different value of lambda n. In a fraction of them you will get this lambda n with a fraction or the probability defined in terms of fraction given by mod c n square. That is if you have capital N of uh, observations then mod c n square times capital N in that many cases you will find a value lambda n. This is how you do a coin tossing problem right or rolling in the die problem. You take a large number of uh, trials and you say how many trials you have a particular value and you take the frequentist approach to the probability and you define this. Even that is not a problem. So far so good. Then you ask the question, okay, I made a measurement in a particular system when I made a measurement, I got a particular eigenvalue lambda n. What is the state of the system after this measurement is made? Well, the state of the system was evolving in time in accordance with Schrodinger equation. The moment you make a measurement, all bets are off. The moment you have made the measurement, in the next instant, the state of the system collapses to the eigenstate of that operator. Suppose you made the measurement and you got the value corresponding to n is equal to 13. Then after that, at that instant, the wave function is defined by f13 of x. And then of course you can evolve the Schrodinger by Schrodinger equation what it does, what happens to that state later on. Okay. So the wave function in quantum mechanics, so to speak, evolves in two different ways. One is as long as you do not do anything, you do not tinker with it and you let it uh, free float, then it evolves by Schrodinger equation. But every time you make a measurement, it so to speak collapses to the Eigen function of the observable which you have tried to measure with the eigenvalue which you have obtained. Now nobody knows why this happens. There are countless experiments which shows to you that this happened. This is very closely related to something which I told you in the very first lecture that if you are trying to observe through which slit the photon went, I mean the through slit uh, which slit the electron went, that is like making a measurement. That is you, you know where it is going by looking at its recoil or something, then it is not going to interfere along two paths. It has a unique path. So once you have done that, it has already collapsed into its eigen function. It is not exactly the same because there are continuous variables and things like that, but broadly this is what happens. Okay? I find it much nicer to think in terms of position and momentum. Most of the books will introduce this in terms of spin states, which I, which I do not like. Okay? So that is why I have taken this approach. So we have got that mystery which is unsolved. So we will just accept it as a fact that to every operator you associate these, uh, these uh, eigenfunctions and eigenvalues. When you make a measurement, the system collapses to one of its states determined by some fn with the value lambda n given by this. Okay, this is what we have. It is both because obviously if you have different systems and you do this, it will be different. It is a property of the system as well as the effect of the measurement. The issue is not so much as that. I mean what we want to do is that, okay, I will tell you what the problem is. The real problem is that what is a measurement? Measurement is an interaction of an apparatus with the system, right? But we assume everything is quantum mechanical. So the apparatus is also quantum mechanical. So I should be able to write down a wave function for the apparatus plus the quantity which is being measured. And then it will evolve, the whole thing will evolve by Schrodinger equation. So then how can I say that something is collapsing? So somewhere along the line, you have to use variables in classical mechanics, that is non-quantum mechanics in order to describe quantum mechanics. This um, I personally find extremely unsatisfactory. Many people find it unsatisfactory, but fortunately not a single experiment seems to give a, a result which is in violation of this. So normally if you have a more exact theory and an approximate theory, the exact theory will stand on its own. It will not require concept from the approximate theory to prop it up. 
You may use that language, but it won't be essential. But in quantum mechanics, because measurements are classical and measurements do something to the quantum system, you need to introduce a classical description at some stage to describe a quantum system. This, this is why it is a mystery. So, so I can think of measurement as a perturbation to the system. That is right. But that does not help. I mean you can think of it as a perturbation and because of which you can say that it got perturbed. It is not that the wave function psi change from psi to psi plus delta psi. It has collapsed into an eigenfunction. It is not a small perturbation at all. Okay? So, the evolution sort of thinks of it like going like this, collapsing, then going like this and collapsing. And if you do not make the measurement, it just goes on. Yeah. What exactly here is classicality? You have to talk about the measurement and observations as a classical thing, which is irreversible. You have, when I say you made a measurement, what do I mean? I, am, I have not given you a quantum mechanical description of measurement. I am just assuming that there is some way in which I can measure things. And that measurement process is almost always classical. And that is what is unsatisfactory. And, and suppose I take a closed system mm -hmm. and I decide which one I will call uh, detector. Yeah. Which one is my system? They call it system and environment, that is the terminology. Yeah. And then somebody else can divide it in a very different way. Absolutely. He will get different results. And okay. What result will get cannot be determined. Oh, yeah. You can determine every result in the sense that you can say what all possible results he will get. But in a given experiment, you do not know what result he will get. You see, suppose you know what operator he is going to measure. I can tell you definitely that he is going to pick up one of the lambdas. Lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda n. If it is a spin system, he will either measure spin up or spin down. There are only two values he will get. Okay, but which value he will get in a given system, we cannot predict. Yes, but then you have already defined here that what is the operator. That is correct. Yeah, that is correct. But Right. Mm -hmm. Then who is measuring and who is collecting? That is exactly why we consider quantum mechanics to be incomplete. We do not know. We do, without introducing a classical observer and a classical measurement process, we do not know how to talk about this wave function collapse. Okay. So, there are of course, as I said, this has a history of 5 decades. So, there are various people who have come up with various approaches. There is something called decoherence, which is my personal favorite, which, uh, which seems to suggest why these things happen, etc. But that will take us far away from what we are going to do in the course. If people are interested, you can come and talk to me and I can suggest what to read up and things like that. But basically, it, even this decoherence does not completely solve the problem. Ultimately, we do not know the answer. We do not know how to formulate quantum mechanics without using any classical construct. I can formulate entire special theory of relativity without talking about Newtonian non-relativistic mechanics. I can formulate entire general theory of relativity without talking about special theory of relativity and get special relativity as a limit of that. But I cannot talk about the entire quantum theory without bringing in classical constraint. Okay, fine. So, we have got up to this. Now, let us proceed a little bit further. Now, rest of it is plain sailing. This is the only catch in quantum mechanics. Okay, so what we have found is that the same system. Sir, yeah. Sir, yeah. Sir, these eigenvectors can be wave function also, right? Like if I am. This Fn. Yes, Fn can be a wave function. Yeah, sure. Okay. That is, yeah, that is. So I compare this one expression for in momentum transformation. Correct. You can write down in a momentum space Schrodinger equation and it will be a wave function. There. No, if I compare both equations like this. One and this one, like coordinate right, right. So, their eigenvectors will be phi uh, in momentum space P and T and e to the power IPX eigenvector. Right, like that. right, right. Yeah, so that is what this expansion tells you yeah, from one representation to the other. Okay. okay, right. So, in fact, that is what I am going to come to next. What we have found is that there is some kind of a redundancy in this description and it would be nice to extract it a bit further. See, what we found was that the same system I can describe in terms of psi of x or I can describe in terms of phi. Of course, here you will say, oh, I am just making a Fourier transform. But that is the point because you can make the Fourier transform and then everything changes. The structure of the operators change, etc., etc. So, can I get rid of this? Can I think in terms of changing the representations in a very nice way? 
Now, it turns out we can and in fact, it is very easy and this is exactly what we do when we are doing vector analysis. So, suppose I have a vector, what is so good about working with a vector v, let us say, this is normal three dimensional vector analysis, vector algebra in fact. What is nice about starting with this vector v rather than its components? To see that, let us relate this to its components. How will you write down its components? Its components you will write or the vector in component form you will write as the component, let us say Vn into V dot En, where En is the basis vector. This is Rusnik and Halliday. En in the basis vectors in the nth direction, E1, E2, E3. V dot E1 will be each of the components, sorry, uh, multiplied by En. Okay. So, you take the component along En, then take the unit vector in En and then you get this thing. And this is what I would have called Vn. Okay. I can do exactly this with these wave functions and uh, states and what not. What I want to do is this again a notation. I want to denote that uh, vector by what is known as a ket. You take a bracket and you divide it into bra and ket. This is the ket. This you write as summation over n, some basis ket n times a dot product which is n psi. Right now, this simple, you think of it as a single unit. This is just a notation like this because I haven't really introduced what is this bra is. I have only introduced ket as a vector, is an element of a vector space, but I haven't introduced this. So, this is purely a complex number. Okay? But this idea is exactly the same as this. What is the convenience of this? The convenience, what is the convenience of this? Why did we use this rather than this? Because this depends on what En I have chosen. Suppose I rotate my coordinate system, then Ens will go into some En prime. Then I can do this expansion in terms of a new set of bases. So, if I am going from coordinate representation to momentum representation to some other representation, that can be thought of some kind of a generalized rotation. So, I can introduce transformations in that basis. And I can think of this V as a quantity independent of basis. Similarly, I can think of this as a state of the system independent of whether I am using X representation or P representation. That is the only advantage. Okay? So, you have got this, this rule where given these basis uh, vectors in that space, I can expand it like this. Now, of course, it would be very nice if we have a structure of a dot product and structure like this, etc., etc. And this is, well, actually today we are introducing two most powerful notations introduced into theoretical physics. One is that summation convention and the second is a notation which Dirac introduced. This itself Dirac introduced, but the idea was that he could give meaning to both of these. Now, this, if you actually talk to a mathematician, he will do this very, very formally by introducing a vector space and its adjoint space, etc., etc. But basically the idea is the following. Suppose I have two vectors, let us say psi and phi, and I want to define a dot product between them. So this is the dot product between two vectors, which I will call phi and uh, psi. One way to do this is that let us choose a representation, say coordinate representation, then the psi is represented by some function psi of x, phi is represented by some function phi of x. These are complex functions and there is a very natural dot product in the space of complex functions. So, I define this to be simply integral over volume, x space volume of phi star this is what I introduced here. Okay? So, this is a very natural product 
in the space of complex functions. So, if I have two kets in this space, then its dot product I define like this. Now, what I want to do is to I want to introduce another space in which the states are represented by these bras, objects like this, and I want to define them. In order to define them, all that I have to do is to say what is its dot product with all the vectors in this original space. So, there is a ket space and a bra space and in the ket space I have all these vectors. If I tell you what is the dot product of this with respect to that then I have defined this. And in fact, I do not have to define it for all the uh, uh, vectors, I only have to define for all the basis vectors. right? So, what you do is that you arrange matters in such a way that this particular dot product is same as this quantity. So, here I am using only kets, so I know what it is. Using that I define the uh, adjoint space where there is a phi and a psi and this product I define to be exactly the same as what is in the right hand side dv of phi star psi. Okay. So, I have these objects kets and bras and then the dot product in that Hilbert space. Uh, this is I mean in fact, you do not ever need to know what a Hilbert space is. And uh, but if you are interested you can go and read some formal textbooks. So, this is a structure which we will introduce. What is the use of this? It has an extraordinarily beautiful application. The application is that in all these we have been working with wave functions or states which are evolving with time. So, let me let me do that also a little bit more formally in terms of this ket notation. Suppose I have this and this is my state psi and the state psi suppose I am working in coordinate representation. Then the Schrodinger equation I will now write as i d by d t of the state let us say at time t is equal to the Hamiltonian operator h acting on that state psi of t. Of course, the Hamiltonian operator we already defined it is minus h cos square by time del square in the normal space. But I can now think of it formally as p square by 2m plus v of x where p is an operator and x is an operator. Okay. What is the only non-trivial thing that is also obvious from this? We said that x is represented like this in one case and p is represented like this in another case depending on the representation. But the commutator between these two, so if I take x alpha p beta both are operators just to make sure. The commutator of that will be i times Kronecker delta alpha beta. Again x p has dimensions of angular momentum, so there is a h cross here which is 1. So, this is independent of the basis, you can work here or work here and you will get this. So, this is the only extra quantum mechanical input which has gone in there. And Given that I have a p square by 2m plus v of x where x and p do not commute with each other and that h is acting on this. So, these operators here for example, this operator we are not going to think of systems which has explicit time dependent like the potential varying with time or something like that. If it is not there things like p and x are not dependent on time these are these are just operators defined once and for all. It is the state vectors which are changing with time. Now, it turns out that there is a very nice way in which I can translate all the time dependence into operators and take the state vectors to be fixed. Now, it turns out to be formally very convenient especially when you go to quantum field theory and things like that. The actual reason for this is a bit tricky. Basically, if you have some symmetries in the theory like Lorentz invariance and you want to impose them. It is a lot easier to impose them in the operators 
rather than in the state vectors. Okay. So, it turns out to be very convenient and so I want to introduce that language. This picture is called the Schrodinger picture as just a terminology and the when you are you translating all the time dependence into operators and taking the uh, state vectors to be time independent that is called a Heisenberg picture. So, I want to tell you how that comes about. Now, before that why does it come about? You can't do this sort of thing in classical mechanics. So, how does it work in quantum mechanics? It works in quantum mechanics because you are not ever going to actually observe a state. You are not going to observe a operator. These are not observable. These are just mathematical construct which you use. What you are going to observe is some kind of a sandwich between these two. For example, I can compute a complex number like this phi at t and operator m acting on psi at t. This is a complex number, so the, I can, I should be able to measure that. It is a real and imaginary part, so to speak. So, in order to obtain this, I first want to rewrite this in a slightly different way. This solves to psi at t equals e to the minus i t h acting on psi at 0. Uh, one general comment when you define something like an exponential or sine or any function of an operator, what you do is to take a Taylor series expansion and then powers of operators are well defined and you know how to work with that. So, you should be able to show that given this if I do i d by d t I end up getting this it is trivial but you should do that. So, if you have that what does this correspond to? This is going to be and similarly if I have phi at t this is going to be phi at 0 e to the i t h acting on the left. This second equation requires a little bit of explanation. So, let me tell you that. I first introduced these kets, then I said that there are operators acting on that kets. Okay. Now, how do I get operators to act on phi? Again you introduce a definition. What you do is the following. Let me wipe this off. Suppose you have a state psi which becomes a state rho under the action of an operator m. This is in fact how you define an operator. You say that this operator acting on all the states what it does. This translation table you should give. Of course, again you will play it cleverly by giving you only its action on basis states. So, if I know how it acts on a basis state then because of linearity you can find out its action on any state. Now, what I want to do is that for this row there is a corresponding bra. Then for this psi there is a corresponding psi. Now, I want to know how to go from here to here. So, I will say that there is another operator in that space which is usually denoted by this symbol a joint acting on the left this defines this quantity if m acting on psi gives you rho then m dagger acting on psi gives you this rho okay now this a joint so therefore if you have some object like uh, let us say uh, phi m psi then if you take the star of that because the dot products are defined by this rule and when I flip the star goes to the other terms this is going to be equal to psi m dagger 
That is, when you take the complex conjugate of this, you flip from left to right and you also change m to m dagger. Okay? So, roughly speaking, this dagger operation is like taking a complex conjugate. And if the, in this particular case, because h is a Hermitian operator, when I take the dagger, I do not have to touch h. So, this e to the minus i t h becomes e to the plus t i t h and that is what is acting on to the left. So, let us plug that in. Then what we get here, that is I have, I am going to substitute for these two from these relations. Then what I will get is phi at 0, this quantity, e to the i t h, then m, e to the minus i t h, psi at 0. Okay. Now, these two objects are at some fixed time, which we have taken to be t is equal to 0. So, they are not changing with time. I mean, they are just fixed. Here, these two were changing with time and m was independent of time. Suppose I now define a new set of operators, which is given by this rule. So, those operators I call the representation of the operator in Heisenberg picture. So, what I am going to say is that uh, m in Heisenberg picture at time t is given by e to the i t h and I will set Heisenberg picture and Schrodinger picture to be the same at t is equal to 0 times m at 0 formally. This is Schrodinger picture, which is the same as Heisenberg picture, e to the minus i t h. This is the definition. So, an operator in Heisenberg picture at time t is evolving and it is the value of that operator at time 0 with this, these two objects sandwiching on both sides. Okay? As far as states are concerned, the state in Heisenberg picture is same as the state at Schrodinger picture at t is equal to 0 or I can put t is equal to 0 here. So, this state is the same in S and H. This is same in S and H. This operator, this whole thing is going to be called M at H. Alternatively, if I write it here, here this is Schrodinger, Schrodinger, Schrodinger. So, a number, a complex number obtained here in Schrodinger picture, where this is independent of time and the cats and bras are evolving with time, is the same as keeping the cats and the bras frozen and letting the operator evolve with time. Okay? This takes a little bit of getting used to. You would have done it in your MSc quantum mechanics, but if you have not just spend some time and try to understand that. The whole idea is that this works, this miracle works because you are only going to measure objects like this. This is the most general kind of object which you will measure. Okay, a complex number. And therefore, that complex number, how it comes about, I can play around and I can do it in either way I like. Okay? Fine. So, just to recap, you take some time t is equal to 0 and at that time, you say that all the Schrodinger operators and Heisenberg operators are the same. All the Schrodinger uh, wave vectors or cats and bras and Heisenberg heads and bras are the same. As time goes forward, in Schrodinger picture, the states evolve, operator remain the same. In Heisenberg picture, states remain the same, operators evolve, that is all. Yeah. So, uh, here t is uh, time. Uh, that is right, yeah. So that is just a parameter. So that is just a parameter. Forward in time, even in backward in time. You can do backward in time, that does not matter. T is just, T can go from minus infinity to plus infinity, it's just a real parameter. Just for convenience, you evolve things forward in time. 
okay? But in principle, you can reverse it back. And if you replace t by minus t, that is equivalent to replacing i by minus i. So I, I, this question came up in a previous lecture. So essentially in quantum mechanics, time reversal goes with complex conjugation, okay? Now I want to, once you have introduced this, it is again plain sailing and you can do a lot of things with it. So I want to just illustrate a few points and then we will stop today. Okay, the next thing which we can do is that once you have these uh, operators evolving with time and states remain the at, uh, at one fixed point, you can work out eigenvalues and eigenkets of time dependent operators. Here there is a particular sign which I find that people get a bit confused, so I want to spend a little bit of time on that. Suppose you have, okay, firstly given this relation, from this you can prove another simple relation, I m dot, assuming I got all my signs right, I m dot will be m commutator h. Just check that the sign is correct in this, whether i or minus i, but this is it. You can show that the time dependence also satisfies this differential equation, okay? The time derivative of m is just a commutator of m with respect to h. The importance of this is if you have an operator which commutes with the Hamiltonian, that does not change with time. It is a conserved quantity, so to speak, okay? So this you can immediately obtain from that, that is the first result. Now what I wanted to do here is that suppose I have an operator, let me call it A, at time t, I can define its eigenkets at that time by this rule. I am working in Heisenberg picture. In Heisenberg picture, kets do not change with time. So I have put an explicit t here that should not be thought of as representing time evolution of the ket. It is just that there are different kets. Suppose you take the operator at time t is equal to 13, it will have eigenkets with some eigenvalues. Then you do it at t is equal to 15, then you will have something else, okay? And this a can also change in general, but these are just eigen, eigenvalue equation written at some time. Now what you do is that suppose you run through this rule. What you get is e to the i t h a at 0, e to the minus i t h t on a, this quantity, this is just the left hand side replaced, a t a. Now you act on both sides with this quantity, then you will get a at 0, e to the minus i t h t a is equal to a e to the minus i t h t a. The curly bracket is to bring to your attention that whatever this object is, a at 0 acting on it gives you the same eigenvalue followed by this. Therefore, this is the eigenket of this operator, right? So by notation, this is going to be 0 a, this entire quantity, t a. In other words, t a is e to the plus i t h 0 a. The reason I did this is because I have seen people making mistakes on this. When you are evolving a state vector in Schrodinger picture, you put e to the minus i t h. Here we are not evolving anything, it is just labels of the eigenkets. There the one at time is, TMT is given by e to the plus i t h, okay? Sometimes people confuse these two and then they don't put the sign correctly and then that can lead to an error. But you have an expression like this 
and you can given any operator you can do this and then you can take its uh, uh, dot products etc etc so this is just a cautionary note now among all the eigen functions and eigen values which one is listing the most important set is the eigen functions of the hamiltonian so if i have a hamiltonian h then i can define its own eigen functions i can either use a formal notation or i can use it in schrodinger picture itself so then i have h phi n is equal to some en phi n i am using a notation as though the energy levels are discrete but it can be continuous as well now suppose i have some arbitrary uh, wave function so of course these phi n's are going to evolve as e to the minus i e n t so suppose i have a wave function psi again showing your picture at time t is equal to 0 which depends on x which i expand as summation some cn phi n of x okay how does this system evolve in time that is easy because each of the phi n's are going to evolve by picking up a phase e to the minus i e n of t therefore i know that psi at t x is going to be summation c n phi n e to the minus i e n of t i want to write this in a slightly different way what i am going to do is i want to substitute for this c n how can i do that i have this so if i take a dot product suppose i multiply it by phi m star and integrate all over i will pick up c n right so i will get here this is summation over n summation over n let me keep phi n of x e to the minus i e n t all that i will keep as it is and i want to substitute for the c n that will be integral over the volume but here i have to explicitly tell you what is the integration variable it is let us say d3 of y <coughs> and i had to get this cn so that is phi n star of y psi at 0 y So this can be simplified further. What I can do is that write the same expression psi at t comma x equals in this I have an integral over d3 y let me write that first. Then there is a psi at 0 y. This is the wave function at t is equal to 0. What is left? What is left is this entire expression which is a summation over n phi n star that is at y. Remember that this is at y, this is at y in the integration. Then you have a phi n of x. e to the minus i e n of t. This is rather interesting. What it is telling you is that the wave function at time t is given by the wave function at time t is equal to 0 with an integration over y times some object. But we have seen this before. What we used to do was to call this the propagator g of t x starting from 0 y 
right? Because then this equation will just become integral over d3 y g t x which are the variables in this starting from 0 y then the amplitude to find it at y in the initial state. Just make sure you understand that. This is how we, we have completed the loop. We started with the path integral expression for this g. Then we derived from it the Schrodinger equation. At that time, we said that if the wave function at t is equal to 0 is given, this integral gives you the wave function at some time. Now, after the Schrodinger equation, all the machinery has been evolved. We introduce the Eigen functions of the Hamiltonian and the Eigen values. Then we find an explicit expression for the propagator. So g t x going from 0 y is summation over n, which could be an integral if energy is continuous, e to the minus i e n of t phi n star of y phi n of x. I am not sure whether I got the star signs correctly, but you can verify that. Okay, So one of them should be the star and uh, I am not sure whether the star should come on the second one or the other, but that is okay. Okay, Those, those algebra you check. So you have an expression for the, uh, see when, when we, what we did was we started by expanding the wave function at t is equal to 0. Then we said that there is a e to the minus i e n t is how each of these wave functions are going to evolve, thereby getting this. Then I wanted to find what this c n is. Okay? In order to find this c n, I have to multiply it by something star there and integrate it out. Okay? So that is what we did here. And then you had this expression and then from which you have an expression for the propagator. But the main message is not this derivation, but if you know the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, then you can write down an expression for the propagator. So you can determine the form of the propagator given the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian. So the original question as to how do you sum over paths, how do you calculate the path integral, etc., is at least partially answered here. You do not have to actually sum over the paths and all that. You start with the path integral and then you write down the Schrodinger equation corresponding to that system. Then from that Schrodinger equation, as long as Hamiltonian is independent of time, it is a closed system, you have the eigenfunctions for the Hamiltonian. And once you have the eigenfunctions for the Hamiltonian, then you can plug it in and then obtain the form for the propagator. So there were questions at that time as to how do we do the sum and I told you that only for a quadratic case we can actually do the sum. So in general you can do this. But of course if you have the Schrodinger equation and you know the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, then most of the time you do not want the path integral. But you may need it for some special purposes, but other than that you may not uh, want to do that. You can study the evolution in the Schrodinger picture itself. Okay? So that is a good place to stop. And uh, questions, comments? Yes. Now when we come, come actually uh, calculate the numerical values. You have to put the h cross in. Yeah. So that is something which you have to learn how to do. See what usually happens, for example, take this. So if this p is momentum and x is coordinate, the product is an angular momentum. So there has to be a h cross here. Okay. So it is e to the i p dot x upon h cross. Similarly, you have e and t. It is energy into time, that is x again, so there has to be a h cross there. Okay? But as far as your computation goes or the, all the algebraic manipulation goes, it is much nicer not to worry about the h cross and that is, and it is also something which can be confusing. So it is best for you to get used to it from as early as possible. It is already a little late because you have done non quantum mechanics course in MSc, but at least now you should get used to setting these constants to unity and working with that. That is why I wanted to introduce that. There was some other hand, yeah. So when we are deriving 
No, not really. What we, the relationship that dA by dx alpha is equal to p alpha was obtained in two contexts. One context was when, this is important, so let me spend some time there. We did not use classical action and let me explain to you why. When you calculate the variation of the action, there is one term which involves Euler-Lagrange terms and a delta x, then another term which is p times delta x. This is true for any variation of the action. That is, if you just take a general variation of the action, this is what you will get. Then when we did the amplitude averaging, the term with the Euler term vanished. I proved that. Therefore, here only this p delta x will survive and that is not coming from the fact that A is classical action. This is true for any action. If the Euler Lagrange equation is true, then no, no, no. We do not need Euler Lagrange equation to be true. See, the, the, the difference between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics, what I told you, let us, let us just work this through. Suppose there is an Euler function E of L, okay? You know what it is, d by dt of dl by dx dot minus dl by dx and all that. This quantity is strictly true in uh, classical mechanics. But you have the result that sum over paths E of L, E to the I over H cross action for that path is equal to 0 in QM. This is an always true statement. In fact, I do not have to say QM. This is an always true statement. So I did not have to assume the Euler function vanishes. I only want the average of that to vanish, which means that the other term survives. And here I do not have to assume A is a classical action. Yeah. While doing closely experiment, right. electrons, right. you do a measurement, then you say the wave collapsed and you will get it. Something like that. I mean, if you are, if you have a measurement which can determine through which slit electron went, there will not be an interference pattern. And that can be happen for a photon also while doing electromagnetic. Ah, okay. That is a lot trickier because now, I mean, it is historically we knew the particle nature of the electron and the wave nature of the photon first. Then came the particle nature of the photons and then the wave nature of the electron. And the reason has to do with that is that you have to keep reducing the intensity of the light in such a way that you are only going to go to something like a one photon limit. The interference pattern which you are creating usually is done in terms of waves, which is a many photon state in the standard electromagnetic terminology. But in principle, you can do that. There are ways of doing photon beam splitters, etc. Then the same result holds. If you know through which hole the photon went, then the photon will behave like a particle. That is correct. That is arising because the there is a Fourier transform. There is a Fourier transform, the e power that the exponential is a eigenfunction of the. That is correct. So, can we take some other eigenfunction? The same, same idea works. I mean, like if you take an operator m and then you have eigenfunctions of that operator and you expand the psi in terms of those eigenfunction, then you can again say that there is a duality between these two. Okay? But it turns out that p and x are sort of fundamental. And it is also very convenient because Fourier transforms are very easy to work with. See, for example, if you are doing a spherical geometry and you have a wave function, like when you are doing a scattering experiment or something, you won't expand it in e to the ip dot x. You will expand it in ylm theta phi. Then what you are actually doing is to expand it in terms of the eigenfunctions of the angular momentum operator. Then I can say that if I have a state, a scattering state, and I measure its angular momentum, what value I will get? I mean, this is this is again something which you would have studied. There is a L and M, and you will get different values, etc. Yeah. Uh, so, do we need the condition that all these functions belong to entry space? Yes, yes. That is uh, that is something which most puritanical mathematicians will insist. But in physics, most of the time you can get away with it because what you can do is to work with a set of quantities called distributions like the so-called Dirac delta function, 
which we always use delta of x minus y. It is not a function in the strict sense of the function. It is actually what is known as a distribution. So the distributions are usually defined by using a set of uh, smearing functions and working with them. Like the def fundamental definition of Dirac delta function could be taken as some f of x, Dirac delta function of x minus y integrated over x gives you f at y. So you have to give me a set of test functions f of x and then define that. Okay. So in that sense you can bypass many of these uh, conditions. Like if you take the wave function for a free particle. It is e to the i p dot x. I mean, suppose you solve Schrodinger equation and look at the eigenfunctions of the free Hamiltonian. These are e to the i p dot x and e to the i p dot x is not square integrable in the sixth sense of the word, but it, it works. Okay, yeah. Any other comments? What the Fourier transform do physically in wave and particle respect Fourier transform? Okay, so there are two ways of thinking about it. One is that it gives you the uncertainty principle. I have not even bothered to discuss that because it is all done in MSE. So if uh, I calculated the mean value of x, I could have calculated the mean value of x square and in particular I could have calculated x minus x bar the whole square, its mean value that will define for me a delta x square. Then you can do a delta p square and then you can show that delta x delta p is greater than h cross. That has absolutely nothing to do with quantum mechanics. This has to come, this is a property of the uh, Fourier transforms. Like if you take a Gaussian, which is the simplest case and you do a Fourier transform, it is another Gaussian with a inverse width. If you take a Lorentzian and then do a Fourier transform, then again the widths will be related by this kind of a behavior. So Fourier transform essentially smears the width in one space with respect to the other. That is required in order that the commutation relation and uncertainty principle coming from it are obeyed. Right. It was, there was equality sign for that summation. Right. And that quantity was obviously greater than 1. Which quantity was greater than 1? G. Why is it greater than 1? If we evaluate that sum over all the, mm -hmm. its modulus will be greater than 1. Ah, you have to be a bit careful because, okay, so you are saying when I take the modulus, I am going to pick up mod square of each one of them, that will be 1. But there will be cross terms. Yeah. Now the cross terms can be anything. And in general is a complex number. See g which you are computing is a complex number. So the complex numbers do not have ordering. I mean there is no such thing as uh, 3 plus 4y is greater than 1 plus uh, 2y, 2i, right? So there is no ordering among complex numbers and you cannot say that it is greater than 1. Even the modulus, there will be terms which can cancel it out. So mod, uh, mod g square is a kind of probability for transition from uh, First point to second point. Uh, should we normalize it? Okay, we shouldn't normalize it. You can normalize it in, in some particular context, etc. But it is not literally taken to be as a integrated over all space is going to be uh, equal to one kind of a normalization. It's a continuum normalization. It is just like e to the i p dot x. Suppose I have a e to the i p dot x as the wave function of a free particle. Then if I take a mod square and integrate it over all x, I won't get 1, I will get infinity. Okay? So these things are all normalized in some direct delta function sense. Okay? Yeah. You can normalize the final wave function and that is what we almost always do. That is you do the integral of the Green's function over an initial wave function you get the wave function and that wave functions are always normalized and you can ensure that the normalization of the wave function is preserved under this evolution. That is also an interesting thing to try out. It is fairly straightforward. You have this wave function at this time given by this wave function at this. Okay? Take mod square of this and integrate over all space and suppose it is 1 and the mod square of this is 1. Then that should be ensured by this g and you will find that it does. Any other comments? Yeah. Sir, uh, when we, in the last class, when we wrote the Lagrangian for the electromagnetic, mm -hmm. they were split in a harmonic oscillator. Right. So then you wrote that your wave function will be product of the states of the harmonic oscillator. That's right. So how will you interpret this thing? Because in particle thing, we have the mod square will be a probability distribution. Oh, same thing here. The... But here, sir, this... No, I, I'll, I'll tell you how you interpret this. 
so what you want to know is that it turns out easier in terms of magnetic field and there is an equal description in terms of electric field. In the electromagnetic theory, magnetic fields are like coordinates, electric fields are like momentum. So it is like uh, this momentum space and the real space here. So I will talk in terms of magnetic fields. What you will have is a wave function, big psi, which is going to be a functional of the magnetic field B of x at time t. Okay. The mode square of this will tell you what is the probability that at some given time t, you make measurements for magnetic field all over the space, it will be given by this function. So give me a function, some 1 upon say let us say cos h of uh, xl, mod xl, that is a function. Then I can ask what is the probability that when I make a measurement, I get that particular magnetic field. So all possible magnetic fields are possible. Of course, this could be peaked, it could be a Gaussian, it could be peaked in some particular magnetic field configuration, then that is the magnetic field you will get most of the time. It is exactly like this. So the language which we have developed is very powerful, it works all over the time. And there is, you can also write down a Schrodinger equation for this. If you write it down in terms of this, then you have to, this is like the coordinate. So you want to have del square which is happening in the Schrodinger equation to be second derivative with respect to the coordinate. So you need a second derivative with respect to a function. So this is called functional differentiation and a second derivative within function space, etc., which is a big pain. So what you do is that you write down this magnetic field in terms of the vector potential and in the k component of the vector potential, then the Schrodinger equation is just the Schrodinger equation for each of the oscillators and you can translate back and forth. Any other comment? Okay, fine. 